Hi everyone. This is the talk on shoulder radiographs. So the first thing I have to ask ourselves is why do we get shoulder radiographs? What are the common views that we get? And what are common findings that we should look for? So why do we get shoulder radiographs? Most commonly we do it for trauma. Uh, here we should know what the common fractures are and dislocations and subluxations and how to identify them. And then we should be able to identify causes of shoulder pain, whether they are acute or chronic. Acute most often is going to be calcific periarthritis or calcific tendinosis, and non-acute will be osteoarthritis. So what are some of the abnormalities that we can find on these? So most of us are used to looking at a single view of the shoulder on which we see a simple thing like this. So you can see a transversely oriented surgical neck fracture and along with it a vertical plane fracture through the greater tuberosity. That's probably one of the more common things. Another thing we can see is discal clavicle fractures. Sometimes we'll be able to see calcifications like in this case and sometimes we'll see scapular fractures. So these are all fairly obvious. Another thing we look for very often is to see if the humeral head is high riding. In other words, if it has migrated superiorly or it's closer to the acromion as compared to the opposite side, um, or sometimes it's just touching the acromion, which gives us an idea that somebody has had rotator cuff insufficiency, and more often than not, it's chronic rotator insufficiency when the rotator when the humeral head rises up. But why do we know need to know more about shoulder x-rays if we can already see so much on the simple single view that we see. So there are two major reasons why I think this is important. One is sometimes what we think is abnormal is normal and in other things what we think is normal is actually abnormal. So let's look at it this way. The first case here is normal variants. So here for example there is a line that is running through the proximal humeral shaft and one could easily mistake this for a fracture and this is probably a, this is a proximal humeral pseudo fracture and it's because of obliquity of the physis that you're seeing this appearance. The second thing that you see not infrequently, not unusually, but is this cystic area here in the humeral head, which can often be, um, it's just a, it's just a, tra the trabeculae look that way and you can see a pseudo cyst of the humeral head. Sometimes you see sclerosis with more subconal cystic changes which can happen with rotator cuff enthesopathy, insertion enthesopathy. This is another subtle finding that sometimes some of you may not have been used to seeing, but you can see gas inside joints. So you can see this linear gas shadow inside the joint. That's normal. You can see a vacuum get phenomenon within the joint, and you'll see this in the hip. Sometimes you see it in the shoulder. So these are two things. So these are a few common variants to remember. Now the other thing that you can remember is that when you look at this x-ray at the outset, if you haven't read many shoulder x-rays, you could easily call this set of x-rays normal. So you'd say this is normal and this is normal and that's that. And what we're going to just explore is why this is not abnormal later on. So there's the old radiology adage, one view is like no view. So here we have a humeral shaft which looks relatively good. And if you look at the axillary view, boom, there's a surgical neck fracture and it's completely displaced. So views do have a role to play and we should know about these views and their roles quite well. Okay. Now this is something that I just drives me mad. Every center in our country seems to do this wonderful abducted view and I don't know what value this abducted view actually has. I have no idea what this view actually does for anyone. So if any of you know what this view is for, please send me a message, email me, write to me, whatever. I would love to know what you have gained from looking at this view. I have gained absolutely nothing from it. So let's look at the first thing which is looking at the acromioclavicular joint. Now here most of the time in trauma we're looking to see if there's acromioclavicular joint widening. And there are two ways you can assess if somebody's got a clavicular joint widening. Many times you look at the image, it will look like it's widened, but it's not really widened. The patient may not have tenderness over the area or nothing else. But if you do have tenderness over the area and you have widening and you want to confirm whether it's widening or not, you can do two things. One is you can take an x-ray without weight bearing and then you can make the patient weight bearing and you can see this widening of the clavicular space. Or you can look at this and you can compare it to the opposite side and see that there's widening of the acromioclavicular joint space. So that will tell you that there's acromioclavicular joint widening and that's one of the signs of grade one acromioclavicular separation. In other words, the acromioclavicular joint capsule is stretched, but it hasn't torn completely and there's a little bit of widening of that joint. Um, here are some variations. So here you can see the normal AC joint. Then you can see this one is widened. So this would be 
when you see widening you believe without load bearing when there's widening then you think that the ac joint capsule has ruptured so that's a type 2 so you can see um, here, so this is the normal one. So you can consider comparative weight bearing radiograph. Then here you can see widening. So this is called grade two. Then here you can see because there's rupture of the superior and inferior capsule. Then here you see grade three. In this case, what's happened is the superior and inferior capsule of the acromioclavicular joint have ruptured. But not only that, you see that there's rupture also of the coracoclavicular ligament. And because of that, you have the superior migration of the clavicle. So these are the common grades you're going to see. There are grading systems that go up to six, but these are the three you need to remember. And then you can have the odd case where there's AC, there's AC separation with a bony avulsion from the distal clavicle. So from the clavicle separation with avulsion from the clavicle. And then in this case, you can see that this patient also has a pseudo fracture. Now a typical view that one would get for the acromioclavicular joint is the Zanka view. And the reason we get this view is if you look at this image over here, you can see how this acromioclavicular joint here is overlapped by the by the acromion posteriorly so this bony overlap makes things challenging so by changing the angle and tilting the beam a bit so from craniocaudal you can move that ac joint away from that clavicle uh, from that acro uh, acromion below and you can see this joint quite nicely so this zanka view is just an oblique view to help you to look at the ac joint nicely the next group of uh, images we're going to look at is internal and external rotation views. Now, these are very important views for us. Uh, in every trauma series, typically you're going to see an AP internal and external rotation view. And along with that, you will typically see a Y view. So that's the standard trauma sequence. Um, and here what you're looking for is to see if there is a change in morphology of the humeral head. If there is no change, that's when you think about a light bulb. Um, and then on external rotation views, you can see the greater tuberosity better. So that's good for looking at greater tuberosity fractures, which are the more common fractures that we see in the shoulder. And then you want to see if there's anything moving between the two views, and that helps us to identify which structure it is. So let's not waste time. Let's go into a couple of examples. So here are normal internal and external rotation views. So you can see here at external rotation, and if you guys just put your hand finger on your on your greater tuberosity and you turn your you turn your shoulder outwards you see that your GT moves out and you'll see this bulb of the G, this bump of the G greater, tu greater tuberosity more laterally. On the other hand, if you turn your hand and the, your shoulder in, inwards or you internally rotate your shoulder, then what you find is the GT moves anteriorly, but it overlaps the bone over here. And therefore you get what looks like here is what we would call a light bulb sign. So this, this is the light bulb that you're looking at. A wonderful diagram I have. So this is the light bulb, right? So here again, this is a patient, you can see internal rotation and external rotation, but in both these situations, this humeral head greater tuberosity is facing forwards. So what this patient is doing in internal and external rotation views is really just pronating and supinating at the elbow and there's no movement of the glenohumeral joint. And that's what happens typically with posterior dislocation. Posterior dislocations, the shoulder dislocates posteriorly and it goes into internal rotation. And then when you internally or externally rotate, when it's locked, it doesn't change its position and you get a persistent light bulb sign and that's a sign of a posterior dislocation. As opposed to that, look at this externally rotated view. If you look at this over here, you can see this little crack in the bone here. It's running from here all the way down here. And this is a subtle non-displaced um, greater tuberosity fracture. And this would be easily missed on an internally rotated view because this humeral head would have moved, this GT would have moved and been sitting over this area on an internally rotated view. And it would be very difficult to do the fracture when it overlies this bone over here. So that's, those are some important things to remember for internal and external rotated views. Okay. So here you can see the persistent light bulb sign and here you can see the greater tuberosity fracture better demonstrated on external rotation. Now another thing that internal and external rotation views are particularly useful for is localizing calcification. So let's look at this case over here. Um, you don't know what's going on here. This patient came with acute shoulder pain. You look at this internally rotated view and everything is bang normal. You say there's nothing wrong with this shoulder. It's fine. But if you look at the externally rotated view, you can see the greater tuberosity has come out and the calcification has come out and you can see it quite clearly here. And with an externally rotated view, you can see it quite clearly. So you can see with internal and external rotated views what happens. And because this is coming on, not seen on internally rotated views, better seen on externally rotated views, um, this is actually related to the supraspinatus. So this is pretty classic for supraspinatus calcific tendinosis. You will see that on internally rotated views, you don't see it. 
on externally rotated wheels, you can see it quite nicely. Let's contrast that with this case where we see this little globule of calcification down here near the axillary recess. And when we do, an, uh, and this obviously, as you can see, you don't see much of the greater tuberosity here. So this is an internally rotated view. And you can see this calcification has moved laterally with external rotation. So as this calcification moves laterally with external rotation, you know that this calcification is sitting in the subscapularis. So don't see on internal rotation becomes more evident on external rotation supraspinatus. Um, moves laterally with external rotation, probably subscapularis. Here's another interesting case. So this case was looked bang normal. This patient had excruciating pain. We looked all over here. We've got, greater to, we've got an externally rotated view. We don't see anything. There's no calcification. And all we had to do was ask the patient where the pain was exactly. We got an internally rotated view. And what you can see over here is very neatly this little calcification that's sitting there, which is actually the latissimus dorsi attachment. Um, so this is a lat dorsi calcification, and this is the importance of rotation used in looking at this.